Welcome, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program, shamanism is going to be the key word for the day. Many of us have heard the term shaman and shamanism, and sometimes I think people actually morphed it into directions that I don't know that it was originally intended. So on the Beyond 50 radio program today, we thought we would bring someone along who's a descendant of the Cherokee tribe and has most of her practice based on native techniques. So we're going to find out what is shamanism, even more specifically urban shamanism, and what it might be able to help do for us. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today, our guest, Julie Redtree. Julie, thank you for joining us here on the program. Hi. I'm glad to be here. Now, a shaman, you became an urban shaman. Tell us what this is. Well, um, traditionally, shamans are the the instruments that the um, spirit world uses to connect with uh, the manifested world or humanity. And... Um, well, being an urban shaman or a modern shaman just is kind of an interesting twist on that because um, our world has changed quite a bit since um, you know people have been practicing this in tribes all over the world for a long time and they still do. But um, being born into the modern world, uh, it's sometimes hard to identify that gift and learn how to use it well. It's a challenge. <laughs> I can imagine it would be, but, you know, it's kind of defining what it is. It seems that you're finding more and more people calling themselves shamans. And I wondered, well, how did you become a shaman? I was always under the impression they sort of become initiated into that role rather than just claiming that's what they are. Well, yeah. I think traditionally if you're born in a tribe, you know, as your gifts uh, that, that you have as a human um, start to show, you know, your tribe would notice them and kind of put you where you belong. Like, say you're a really good weaver, you know, you go and learn with the other weavers. Or if you're a great artist, you, you go and learn with the other artists. But, you know, we don't, we don't have any shamans to teach us in our modern culture. So um, <clears throat> it's just, it's an interesting path. It, and it can, it can it can make you feel like you're losing your mind. <laughs> ah. But but um, once you figure out what's going on and 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 seek out some people who who um, practice shamanism, it it gets a lot easier and less confusing. So now tell us how a person practices as a shaman. Are there particular rituals or exercises things they do? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I studied with a woman who knows a lot of um, Peruvian shamanism, which is strangely very close to almost exactly like um, Tibetan Buddhism, which is interesting that they connect. But um, I learned from her, and even Native American techniques, um, there's, you know, there's kinds of uh, like grounding rituals that you can do, and then there's certain ways to work on people to align their energy centers and to, to remove what um, some people call, like, power intrusion. There's mm -hmm. um, rituals for stuff like that. Because I think a lot of times, too, people might have the thought that in shamanism, it's pretty much one of those things that have magic behind it. But it really isn't all that, is it? No. Actually, when I started to, to practice, it was, it was very practical. You know, it was like, I mean, what, what you're seeing is very strange. You know, when I'm working on someone, often I'm, I'm hearing, you know, my guide speaking to me or I'm seeing animals kind of in my mind's eye, I guess. But, um, but what I'm doing has a very practical side to it. It's like, um, you know, like setting a bone has a very practical side. You know, aligning mm -hmm. someone's spirit has a very practical side. Now, tell us how you apply shamanism in a way that helps others. Well, I feel like um, uh, people suffer from a lot of things that they can't seem to cure. And the more I learn about this, the more I realize that um, we get what I call like 
soul bruises or soul breaks, like just from living, you know, and that's normal. It's not pathological to get those. It's just like, you know, bumping your head and it takes time to heal or maybe you need to go to the doctor and get treatment for it. Um, shamanism is kind of like that, but for your spirit or your soul. So um, I feel like it's, it's very helpful in uh, treating things that, that just can't, just have mysterious uh, origins, like, you know, depression or anxiety or um, like a, just a loss, a, a loss of sense of self, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And I, I noticed, too, that you've actually worked with people, uh, I guess, cancer patients or people who are in hospice as well. That's got to be quite challenging. Yeah, it is. I actually, that came out of total empathy um, working with those kinds of people. My child's father had been sick and still is sometimes sick with cancer. And I was spent a lot of time in OHSU just kind of freaking out. Mm. <laughs> and, and those traumas, like emotional traumas, physical traumas can cause what shamans call soul loss, which is just it's, it's a survival technique that humans have where we kind of we take a, a part of ourselves, some of our, our energy, and we kind of stash it away to help us survive trauma. And so tr- like cancer in the family, that's, that can cause a lot of soul loss. And so you become dim and kind of, you know, just a piece of you not functioning. And so um, I felt that very acutely, and I and I felt it made it even harder to um, to to be a caretaker of someone who was sick when I was experiencing a mm-hmm. kind of a sickness of my of my own in my soul. And so I I, I decided to go to um, OHSU <laughs> and just help as many people as I could there, and connect with connect with um, people who caretake for. Um, cancer patients and also for like uh, children with developmental disabilities because that's stressful in the same kind of way to your right. spirit. Mm-hmm. Now tell us about some of the children you've worked with with developmental disabilities. I, I don't work with the children. I work oh, with their parents okay. because they're in that sustained um, stressful environment of like of, of helping, you know, um, kind of on the output all the time when they need, they need some tune-ups for themselves, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And do you find that it really brings them more into balance and creates more presence for them in the now? Oh, yeah. I see a lot of relief in their, in their, um, in, you know, their personality, but also, like, energetically um, kind of lifted, released. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. Now, is there a website people can find out more about your work? Yes, my website has a crazy long uh, <laughs> um, address, but I believe there's a hyperlink on your um, on your newsletter for it. Okay. <clears throat> That's the Beyond 50 Radio newsletter she's talking about. You can find out by visiting our website, beyond50radio.com. Uh, you know, it's just such fascinating work, you know, to realize that most of what you like to help people do uh, is to, you know, kind of clear the traumatic uh, environments that they may be in as caregivers of, of people, you know. And you don't so often hear about that. It's usually caregivers for the people that they're giving care to, and that's where the focus seems to be. And you forget that people who actually, you know, are caregivers tend to get a lot of their energy taxed and, you know, can really use uh, a refill, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, the... <clears throat> the structure of our healthcare system, you know, funnels tons of, of energy towards the patient, which is wonderful. But, you know, I mean, they need that. They're sick. But, yeah, there are, there is this, it also, the structure of our culture says that, you know, mm-hmm. one or two people are caring for that person when they're not in the hospital. And that, and they are living their lives, <laughs> you know, on top of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, that seems like an unfair amount of um, stress to ask a person to deal with in a sustained like, amount of time without, without getting something coming back in. Now, I, I know it's, I, I've been through that myself, you know, having had certain situations in my life where someone 
that you know I cared for became very ill, you know, even almost to the deathbed sort of a situation. And yeah. then you realize, like you were saying, there's so much attention focused on the patient, which is what should be happening. But after a while, when you feel a sense of stability there, it's like the people around them are kind of standing there, okay, now what? <laughs> you know, we're kind of out of steam here. What do we do next? Yeah, I have a friend who works in um, in the medical profession. He's a paramedic. But um, he he said he sees all the time people um, get sick and then they get better and then their caregivers get like three times as sick. Oh boy! <laughs> and then I'm like, wow, that's not that's not balanced. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I'm curious, Julie. Is there a ritual or rituals that you perform uh, as you work with people like this? Um, well, whatever I'm bringing through. From from spirit isn't I don't I don't really have a say in what um needs to be done I just listen um, I have like a team you okay. know that of, of spirit guides that give me information so if there's a ritual that needs to be done then um, I'll do it you know whatever they tell me to do <laughs> but the, the care that I do is very tailored to exactly what that person needs and what they're ready for so there's no like set ritual but um definitely are times where rituals need to be done mm-hmm. i'm curious have you ever had an experience where you were really surprised by what was coming through and how it helped someone oh sure <laughs> yeah there i'd imagine you've probably had a few of those well yeah i mean the stuff i see sometimes i can't I still, I mean, I've been doing this for a while now, and I still am like, am I really seeing that? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And um, no one instance pops into mind, but, um, well, actually, the other, like, just recently, I was working on my child's father, who still has cancer, and um, I, it was the first time I had worked on him, actually, and um, I saw nothing. And that was really interesting. And because normally I always see something. And my guides were like, they didn't give me any information. But that was the information they wanted me to have, was that, um, that his energy was moving that slowly, that it was like like nothing. And, and that's weird. Like, that surprised me because um, there's always, this job is never boring. <laughs> right, I can imagine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now, do you work with people in their homes, or is there a location situation where you really prefer well, to be? I have a setup in my house that's nice. I have, um, you know, all the, the things that I use, like certain feathers and sage and a drum and, you know, stuff like that. But I, I can work on people anywhere, um, really. Mm-hmm. Fascinating work here. I know that I have here in the producer's notes about baby shamans. What's that all about? Oh, well, um, I'm, I'm currently writing a book about how to help people in our modern world who are, I think of as baby shamans, um, like how to help them um, transition gracefully without thinking they need to go to the loony bin (laughs) because Ah. they suddenly can talk to dead people, (laughs) which Mm -hmm. is kind of what happened to me. (laughs) Um, Yeah, they call it being tapped. Like sometimes all of your your gifts can kind of wake up at once. And for me, they woke up in like, it felt like three days. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was working um, herding goats of all, all jobs uh, in the mountains in California. So I was all alone on this hill, and I, I was suddenly aware of all the, um, the spirits that had lived on that hill, like Native American spirits. And uh, it, was, it was very overwhelming. So I, that, that feeling of just not knowing what's going on, I'm, I'm trying to write a book that's like a... Um, helps baby shamans just it's like a handbook baby shaman handbook you know how to how to to transition what's normal to see you know how to not get scared by what you can see how to embrace those things as like as it as a gift 
you know, mm-hmm. see the value in that. Now, what is it that you exactly see or experience? Um, in general? Right. Um, well, it's different all the time, but like, uh, oh, I was, um, it's, it's different all the time, but, but mostly, um, I'm just aware of the, of the spirit world in a, in a way that is, uh, is palpable, the right word, <laughs> you can mm-hmm. feel it. You know, um, and then also um, just like visions. Sometimes uh, I can feel other people's sicknesses, like if I'm close to them, like walking by them in the park, stuff like that. I mean, if you don't know what what that is, it can be very unnerving. You don't want to leave your house. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I had an experience once. I was a, a landscape designer for a long time in San Francisco. And I had a client who I hadn't seen in a long time, and and he came out, you know, to say hi. And my friend, it was mostly my friend's job. I was helping him garden and get it all together. And he was talking with my friend, and I was just next to him, like, trying not to, like, I felt like I was going to throw up. I felt really sick. And and after he left, I just grabbed my friend's arm and kind of keeled over and was like, Andrew's sick. And, and he was like, oh, yeah, I forgot you have this. <laughs> I was like, "What is it? <laughs> Make it uh-huh. go away!" <laughs> but sure enough, he was sick and was going to the doctor for all kinds of stuff. And and um, yeah, it can be uh, a little overwhelming at times if you don't know what's happening. I can imagine. Now, is this <laughs> something that inherently maybe all of us have? It's just a matter of whether it gets awakened or we move toward it. Yes, yes, I definitely feel like everyone. I feel like humans are, are made with these receptors, you mm-hmm. know? It's not like a shaman is like a special type of human. Right. I, and I don't really know much about past lives, but I feel like um, maybe people who get the gift of, of just, I call it like a knack. You right. know, if you're a shaman, you just have a knack for that stuff. And... I feel like personally, like I've done some stuff in past lives, like that that gave me um, kind of that knack. But uh, anybody can do it, you know. And it, I I feel like anyone can practice and like exercise those muscles and learn to to see things mm-hmm. the kind of the way I see them. You know, from your experience, because I had mentioned earlier in the program, there are a lot of people that claim they're shamans, you know, and sometimes you kind of wonder if they're self-serving. And So I wonder if for the listeners out there, because this may be a direction they might want to go that's just, it's interesting, it's off the beaten path, but, you know, it's been around for centuries. Uh, So, (coughs) you know, Mm -hmm. it's sort of like the joke about, you know, rice. How could a few million Chinese people be wrong sort of a thing? Well, it's the same thing with shamanism, you know. <laughs> How could centuries of practice be wrong, you know, sort of, so to speak. But the right. fact is, if they decide to, to move in this direction, how do they know that they're running into somebody who, you know, is authentic versus someone who, you know, is a charlatan, for lack of a better word? Yeah, I, I, you know, I have a hard time even when I'm practicing with people and learning from them, I'm always kind of keeping one eye on them, like, hmm, you know, where's this coming from? And, like, because I, I used to go to Burning Man, and everyone there is a shaman, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was actually a, a huge part of why I never wanted to call myself that for years. After I had my shamanic crisis, I was like, I am not that, you know, and I don't want people to think that I'm, like, a poser, you know, or charlatan, but one thing I've noticed that all people who have this gift have in common is they really, 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 really didn't want to have this gift. (laughs) Ah. (laughs) I guess it must take some doing when you're in the shower and all of a sudden you get a visitation from the other side. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, they're scared, they're like, just, you know, and then, so like, and and then when I talk to other shamans, like I have a neighbor who, 
<coughs> I believe has this gift, and he he's still like learning, you know, and doesn't call himself a shaman. But when we chat, he's like every shaman I've ever met didn't want to have this gift. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I even read a book about a native healer um, called uh, Medicine Bear Lake. I think is his name. He's awesome, but he actually begged for shamans to take the gift away from him, wow. and. None of them would try. One of, one of them tried, and that shaman died a year later. Oh, no. And, and, and so, I mean, there's kind of, there's some, it's kind of like a, rele- like the, a, a, a reluctance, I, I've noticed. Just, oh, please, no. Because it, with it comes, you feel everything that you, every person you work on. I mean, if I'm pulling out a wound that they got when they were six, I feel every single thing that they felt when they got that wound. Huh. And, and then that is not fun. <laughs> no, I could, you know, it's funny because I was just recently uh, uh, talking with a gal and she uh, merges both the practice of Reiki and also dream work. And oh, cool. so we were talking about Reiki, kind of, you know, getting the listeners to understand more of what it is. Uh-huh. And what you're describing there, I actually made reference to an original Star Trek series episode. <laughs> and it was about where they go on this planet, and these aliens decide to put Dr. McCoy under all these rigorous physical ailments. And they have oh. this empath, who uh-huh. is this female from a planet of empaths that do exactly what you're talking about. Oh, you know, he'd get a laceration, so she'd put her hand on him and remove it from him and then it would oh. be on her arm and then it would slowly disappear so she would take on it's a lot like that yeah exactly and she says well the, the cut ki- ki- excuse me the kind of reiki that i practice isn't like that however there are practices of types of reiki out there that do exactly what you're talking about wow, and i thought it would be a fun crazy. reference for people to go okay I'll go and I'll watch that Star Trek episode so they got a better understanding of what it was we were talking about. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, and for a long time, I was like that person. Before I learned to hone my skill, I was like that person, but the cut would stay on me. I didn't know how to, how to, how to drain the mm-hmm. energy. Right. Like, uh, and, and, and so I was really not wanting to do any of that. But now I realize I, ha- I, I know how to push it out, how to just let it go. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, then, and, I, and I feel very supported by my, my guys and kind of the team that I work with in the spirit world. And so it's not scary for me to take on that pain, even though I feel it perfectly to a T. But I know I can I can kind of digest it and, and and compost it I guess for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. and so then it's not scary, but it's still it's intense. Um, so I I cry sometimes a lot of times when I work on people, um, just feeling with their wounds like that. It's it's pretty fascinating stuff when you realize people out there in the world are able to do what it is you do and to realize that you can move beyond conventional ways of healing into what seem to be unconventional or alternative. But as I always like to joke is the fact that it's funny we call these alternative methods, but they've been around long before the methods we got used to <laughs> are. That's true. You know? and, yeah. and, you know, especially when it comes to emotional balance and support, when somebody is experiencing a trauma through someone else, you know, then I can see that's such a valuable uh, way that you serve people there. Yeah, I feel, well, that might be one thing, um, how you can tell if someone's a charlatan or a shaman. Um, every shaman I know has this real servant's heart, and they they really just want to help people. Mm-hmm. And, <laughs> you know, it's it's that part of, I think, the programming or the gift is like, you know, if you had that ability and you, you didn't want to share it, you know, that would be a weird structure. But every shaman I know has that ability really just wants to help. Um, mm-hmm. Like, the, it's, like, programmed in us to just want to strike balance, you know. Mm-hmm. I feel like we're balance seekers, um, harmony. Yeah, when you overflow with a specific gift, you certainly need to share it with others. What else are you going to do with it? Yeah, I mean, that's why it's there. <laughs> People need it. 
Now, I know you said your website had a long URL, uh, oh. and I was trying to look it up here so I could give people a better idea. But and my, my email is much shorter. Um, okay. it's, it's one who sees in the dark, which is the direct translation of the word shaman. Okay. So one who sees in the dark at gmail.com. Okay. And would you be on Google Plus at all? or? Um. I, I don't use that. I think I'm on it by default. I okay. think you can find okay. me on there. I think there's a little shingle with my name. Um, yeah, that would be under Julie Redtree, I think. Oh, okay, very good. So one who sees in the dark at gmail.com? Yeah. And that's how they can find out a way to reach you and get more information about how they might be able to uh, you know, use your services now. Is this something you have to be in person, or have you been able to work with people over the phone? I can work on people remotely, okay. yeah. Okay. I always like to at least let our listeners know that that's possible. So. Yeah, that, that's, that's something I can sh do. Shamans know no time or space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can travel. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julie, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It's always interesting to hear you know, about people who have – the kind of gifts that you have and how they're using them in the world. Well, thanks for having me. I, I really enjoyed chatting with you. There you go. And again, for the, well, at least the email link, it's one who sees in the dark at gmail.com is where you can find out more about Julie, correct? Yes. Very good. Julie, again, thanks for being on the program today. Yeah, have a good day. You Thank too. you. Shamanism, get out there and find out its practical use. You'd be amazed at what you might be able to experience. Also, be sure to visit us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. And be sure to become our e-newsletter subscriber. It's absolutely free. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. And remember, live your day past halfway. <laughs>